one. Welcome to FCPA Flash, the official podcast of FCPA professor and moderated by Professor Mike Kaler. FCPA professor is the leading source of daily FCPA news and commentary and the most authoritative source for those seeking to understand and apply the FCPA. To learn how FCPA professor can elevate your FCPA knowledge, please visit www.fcpaprofessor.com. FCPA Flash is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group manages your integrity and risk profile, turning compliance into a competitive advantage. The Red Flag Group assists companies in developing and maintaining efficient and effective corporate governance and compliance programs and has a proven track record in providing integrity due diligence investigations in 194 countries. Thank you for listening to the FCPA Flash Podcast. This is Professor Mike Kaler, and I invite you to my next FCPA Institute in Miami on January 12th through the 13th. To learn more about the two-day FCPA Institute and how it has elevated the FCPA knowledge and practical skills of a diverse group of professionals, please visit fcpaprofessor.com and click on the FCPA Institute. Welcome to FCPA Flash. This is Professor Mike Kaler. And today's guest is Juliet Sorensen. Ms. Sorensen is a law professor at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, and she previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago, where she prosecuted fraud and public corruption cases. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Professor Sorensen recently published a book along with her co-author, David Hoffman, a lawyer at Sidley and Austin, titled Public Corruption and the Law. What motivated you to write the book? David and I were motivated to write the book after we each uh, separately designed and uh, implemented our on the subject, uh, David at University of Chicago and myself. Uh, and uh, and we individually discovered in putting our materials together that there was no single uh, encompassing uh, case book or treatise on the subject of public corruption and the law. Uh, we initially thought that um, writing a case book would be as easy as uh, merging our two syllabi. It turns out it's a little more work than that, um, but we perceived a, a need uh, to be met, and we aim to meet it. Now, obviously, the, the topic of public corruption uh, and the law is, is, is much broader, of course, than, than just the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and we'll talk about some uh, issues outside the context of, of the FCPA a, a little bit later uh, in this conversation. But uh, given the nature of, of the FCPA Flash podcast, I, I do want to uh, talk about some FCPA subjects, uh, including a, a chapter of your book is titled the unique enforcement problems presented by public corruption, including the challenges of defining, identifying, uh, and measuring corruption. Now, this general topic reminds me of one of my favorite portions of the FCPA's legislative history, uh, and that's actually your father, uh, Theodore uh, Sorensen, who played an active role uh, in the FCPA's legislative history uh, his following observation, and then if I may, I just want to, to quote your, your father's uh, previous words that were spoken or written over 40 years ago uh, and ask you to, uh, to comment on this as, as well as uh, some of the issues he identified are, are present today. Your father wrote, corporate bribery abroad is not the simple, safe issue it seems at first blush. There will be countless situations in which a fair-minded investigator or judge will be hard put to determine whether a particular payment or practice is a legitimate and permissible business activity or a means of improper influence. Reasonable men and even angels will differ on the answers to these and similar questions. At the very least, such distinctions should make us less sweeping in our judgments and less confident in our solutions. Again, just an excellent 
uh, observation, I think, from your father uh, nearly 40 years ago. Do you think these challenges still exist today when it comes to the general topic of corruption? They absolutely exist today, Mike. And, uh, of course, my father wrote those words while Congress was in the process of holding extensive hearings uh, on uh, whether or not it should adopt uh, legislation akin to today's Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And I think what my dad was cautioning was that uh, the world functions and international business often functions in shades of gray. Um, and that includes uh, transactional and moral gray areas. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, a lawyer advising his or her client, uh, the client's agent uh, out in the field, uh, and uh, even um, an investigator or prosecutor uh, will often be challenged to uh, make, a dis uh, make a determination as to whether or not uh, indeed an actual bribe with the requisite uh, criminal intent has taken place. Um, I think that Congress tried to anticipate some of these challenges in aspects of the legislation, including the facilitation payments exception, including exempting foreign public officials uh, from liability under the Act. But um, to be sure, uh, the, uh, the complications and challenges of corporate bribery abroad um, are just as present today as they were 40 years ago. Yeah, to be sure, there are, are a lot of gray areas, and I know, um, you know, like like you, uh, you have a lot of conversations with whether it's students or, or whether it's uh, uh, professionals or whether it's practicing lawyers or prosecutors, and, and we all seem to use the word bribery and corruption as if it has a, a crystal clear uh, universal definition. When the reality is, as I think your father pointed out and as you just pointed out, that while a lot of people would obviously agree on certain transactions and certain payments as being unequivocally uh, you know, bribery and corruption, there is a lot of gray area. Do you think some of the uh, public policy discussions that, that people have in this area, uh, that sometimes people are talking past each other or for not having a meeting of the minds on certain topics because the, the term bribery and corruption is a, kind of a, a vague, amorphous concept in many cases? I think sometimes people are talking past each other, partly because everyone thinks that they know what bribery is and what corruption is. I, it seems to be simple. It seems to be common sense. Many people have what they believe to be personal experiences. Uh, with some form of corruption. And yet, when it comes to interpreting and applying the law, courts find it challenging. And, uh, and corruption generally, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in particular, partly because it is so rarely litigated, uh, is still a work in process when it comes to common law interpretation and definition. Yeah, it very much is, and I think uh, the recent enforcement action against J.P. Morgan based upon internship and hiring practices is, is perhaps uh, you know, a good example of, of what you speak of, um, that uh, enforcement action, of course, the U.S. government labeled to be bribery and corruption, but at the end of the day, it was really not one ounce of, of judicial scrutiny of, of those enforcement theories um, in, in that case. Now, the FCPA is, um, has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, in approximately one year or so, we will sort of reach a meaningful anniversary in, in that the FCPA uh, will turn 40 years old. But here we are in, towards the end of 2016 with one month remaining, I guess, in the enforcement uh, calendar, and we are already uh, at a record in terms of the number of corporate uh, enforcement actions. There have been more corporate enforcement actions in 2016 than there has been in you know, FCPA history. So, in your mind, does that represent success? Or is that something short of success, given that one might expect that there would be less enforcement, not more enforcement, uh, of a successful law as it matures over time? Well, I think that the second half of your question, that is to say, uh, does, this, does success mean more enforcement or less enforcement, really shows how challenging it is to measure corruption. 
Uh, sometimes people choose to measure corruption in terms of number of cases brought. Um, that is not necessarily reflective of the level of corruption in the society. It could be that the executive branch, the prosecutor's office, has chosen to put their resources towards corruption. Um, it could be uh, that there was an anomalous spike involving many uh, uh, individual defendants charged with a crime, uh, for example. Um, it could be that corruption has in fact declined, but it remains a high priority, for example, in the Northern District of Illinois because of historical problems with corruption. Uh, with respect to the number of corporate enforcement actions uh, that have been brought so far in 2016, uh, I do not uh, take that in and of itself to mean that the FCPA is achieving its desired end. Uh, and I'll quote to you from the FCPA Department of Justice Resource Guide uh, as to the stated purpose of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. According to the Department of Justice, the FCPA's purpose is to address the global problem of corruption and thereby increase the public resources that can be better spent on improving access to quality health and infrastructure. And to be sure, corruption does have a highly negative effect on economic growth and money that is lining the pockets of a public official that could be better put towards paving a road or building a school uh, is money that's not being well spent. Um, but uh, corporate enforce enforcement actions alone do not make the FCPA a successful statute. A couple of counterindications. Number one, uh, other measurements of corruption worldwide and again, the stated purpose of the FCPA is to have an impact globally, do not reflect a decrease in corruption. Rather, corruption remains a pernicious problem around the world, outside of the United States. The second issue is that corporate enforcement actions, as you know, are often resolved without a, a uh, finding by a finder of fact, either a jury or a judge, and they're resolved uh, with really scant judicial oversight or review. Um, and so the government is not put to its burden of proof uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. The quantum of evidence is not measured by 12 people who have to reach a unanimous verdict. Uh, and, uh, and that is more likely to happen if the Department of Justice were to charge individual defendants uh, than when the department ch charges corporate entities uh, that are more likely to enter into a monetary settlement to avoid uh, a factual finding uh, of guilt or uh, of guilt or possibly uh, innocence, um, but also um, because uh, corporate defendants have the means to enter into a non-prosecution agreement, in which case they're not indicted at all, or a deferred prosecution agreement. And you were a, a prosecutor um, a, a previous to your your current position, so you're obviously uh, have been familiar with the prosecutorial uh, mindset. Do you think prosecutors, um, whether at the DOJ or the SEC in this area, um, prioritize a quantity uh, of enforcement uh, over quality of enforcement, recognizing, as you just indicated, that um, there's no independent impartial fact-finding. There's no um, you know, advocacy, per se, before an independent uh, you know, judge or, or jury, for that matter. Uh, do you think quantity is being prioritized over quality, and, and if so, um, is that necessarily a, a, a healthy prioritization? I believe that number of cases brought can be viewed as a proxy for productivity or efficiency. Um, which, as you say, is dangerous if that results in a quantity over quality mindset. Uh, that said, I also believe that the vast majority of cases charged by the Department of Justice are carefully considered in terms of whether or not the evidence would meet the burden of proof if the case were to go to trial. Is that true in an area of the law where the vast majority of cases are charging corporate defendants that uh, settle prior to the furtherance of the criminal process? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's an interesting question because, you know, at least um, it seems uh, it seems that the DOJ and, and the SEC, it's, it's all about the numbers that uh, that they frequently 
uh, touts and press releases and, and public speeches, it's, it's the numbers, it's the, it's the settlement amounts that have been uh, secured. But it's an open question as to you know whether that really, when you think about it, as you alluded to, really represents uh, success. Now, moving away from perhaps the, the enforcement uh, topic of the FCPA to you know, perhaps thinking about uh, the FCPA uh, more broadly. Uh, again, as we reach this uh, 40th anniversary here, do you believe that either the FCPA itself, the actual statute, or perhaps enforcement agency policies and procedures when it comes to FCPA enforcement could be improved to, to better achieve the, the FCPA's stated objective, which you previously articulated? I do, Mike, and I think I indicated earlier, you know, why I think that it could be improved. Uh, a couple of points to make. First, I do believe that um, really as articulated in the Yates memo that the Deputy Attorney General issued uh, in this administration, the prosecution of individuals who are culpable um, tends to have a deterrent effect, uh, possibly more than the prosecution of corporate entities. Uh, now, uh, it is true that prosecuting individuals who are more likely to put the government to its burden of proof requires resources. Uh, it requires uh, hard investigative legwork. Um, investigating corruption is hard. Um, it may require uh, the types of resources that were used uh, ultimately unsuccessfully uh, in the Africa Sting case. Um, but I think that allocating those resources is worthwhile uh, if the department really does want the FCPA to have the impact uh, that it says it does. Yeah, and it's you know pretty amazing whether it's the Yates memo um, as a matter of formal uh, DOJ policy or or the many um, DOJ and SEC enforcement attorney speeches, um, really consistently for the last decade, um, the officials have been talking about the importance of individual prosecutions, how individual prosecutions achieve maximum uh, deterrence, so on and so forth. But you know, when you run the numbers, approximately 75% of uh, DOJ corporate actions are lack. Um, individual prosecutions, and although the Yates memo is still roughly only 14 months old, here, um, it's interesting to observe that in 2016 there's been fewer uh, individual FCPA prosecutions than uh, before the Yates memo. Uh, what do you make of, of those, I think you can call them inconsistencies, and, and do those inconsistencies um, say something about uh, DOJ enforcement in this area? What I would infer um, is that the DOJ, notwithstanding the Yates memo, is being very conservative and cautious when it comes to charging individuals. Um, the department has a high conviction rate. It wants to maintain a high conviction rate. Uh, and uh, given a couple of high-profile recent individual prosecutions that were less than successful, um, I believe it has become somewhat gun-shy in uh, evaluating the cases uh, of individuals involved in international corporate bribery and choosing which ones it wants to charge. Again, uh, being mindful that individuals are, are more likely to put the government to its burden and take the case to trial than a corporate defendant. Gun shy in the individual context, but perhaps trigger happy in the corporate context. Those were <laughs> those were in my words, uh, not, not yours. But, uh, that, sounds, that, that sounds right to me. Just wanted to follow the the analogy there. Uh, the, the book, of course, and again, is Public Corruption and the Law, a copy of which uh, will be linked to uh, in this podcast episode, is much broader than the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and I want to uh, sort of end on a, a broader question, um, not necessarily FCPA specific, but what are some of the other forms of corruption that are, are discussed um, in your book, and why do you believe some of these other forms of corruption are troubling from a public policy perspective, and why? Well, you're right. Beyond the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, the book touches on many different uh, forms of what have been variably termed corrupt activities, and not only 
uh, bribery and activities that are traditionally criminalized uh, under the criminal law. Uh, the book looks at uh, patronage. It looks at uh, gerrymandering and redistricting, in other words, methods to retain political power. Uh, it looks at, uh, at campaign finance and the extent to which uh, a lack of campaign finance regulation might corrupt the political or electoral process. Again, that doesn't come to mind typically when we think about uh, the criminal law and public corruption. Uh, and then finally, in addition to the FCPA, and actually from the section on the FCPA, uh, which features, by the way, um, your uh, summary of the statute's history in your, in your Ohio uh, Law Journal article uh, about the FCPA's history, the book really pivots uh, to uh, international laws uh, that aim to take on corruption, not only the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, which basically mirrors the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, but also the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, and then the book looks at a sampling of jurisdictions around the world and how they have uh, tried to take on various forms of corruption uh, and the extent to which they uh, differ from or uh, share methods and means with the United States. I know you've uh, spoken, um, uh, and I know it's included in the book, about uh, corruption in, in sports and, and corruption uh, in climate change. Now, now, at least as to the land of corruption and, and climate change is, is not something that um, is perhaps immediately uh, apparent to, to most people who, who look at this topic, but, but what do you see as the linkages perhaps between um, climate change, environmental issues, uh, so on and so forth, and corruption? There's strong links really in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, Part of the, the unfortunate era of climate change that we live in, we're seeing an increase in extreme weather events. Uh, that might be a hurricane. Uh, it might be uh, super storm, storm Sandy. Uh, it might be a snowpocalypse of a couple of years ago. Uh, and extreme weather events create essentially emergency situations. Uh, without uh, proper uh, advance planning for um, extreme weather emergencies, uh, what's going to happen after an extreme weather event? Money is going to come in uh, so that schools can reopen, so that people can uh, have shelter, so that roads can be cleared. Uh, but without the proper oversight in an urgent time-sensitive situation, the atmosphere is really ripe for uh, sweetheart deals, for bribery, for kickbacks, for those relationship-based transactions. So that's one area in which corruption is linked to climate change. The other area is in a new era of climate change uh, regulation uh, and climate finance. Uh, governments are offering uh, incentives uh, to uh, comply with uh, carbon emissions uh, caps and goals in part in compliance with our international obligations to the UN Climate Change Convention. And transparency and accountability in climate finance uh, is essential to make sure that we meet our goals of, of limiting climate change um, and that that climate finance isn't uh, misappropriated or frittered away. Well, thank you for those insights uh, in taking listeners to spaces uh, beyond the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, as well as uh, providing your insight and, and observations about uh, FCPO enforcement and, and related issues. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the FCPA Flash. So again, today's guest has been Professor Julia Tomlinson. She's the author, along with co-author David Hoffman, a lawyer at Sydney and Austin, of Public Corruption and the Law. Uh, but you might want to put uh, uh, on your book chat and, and reading list to gain a more sophisticated understanding uh, of the general topic of corruption and bribery. Thanks again, Julia. Thank you, Michael.